Good morning, my name is Danielle Applestone, and like John said, I'm running a hardware startup. And we are kind of cliche at this point in the mission, of building a desktop-sized machine for manufacturing. And the reason why we do this is we want more people to participate in creating the hardware products of the future. And so when John called me like almost 24 hours ago and was like, hey, someone dropped out, do a keynote. What do you want the title to be? And I was like, uh, machinist and the artisan. Because <laughs> um, I think it's really important as we look forward to this future of new hardware products that it's not just about the technology, but it's about the craft. And it's really important. But on the way here, I decided to change my talk completely course, to talk about what I think is kind of a looming issue with hardware is we create this product and we want people to develop new pieces of hardware. But as a hardware company, we understand what the climate is like. It's very difficult. And it's not only difficult because hardware is hard and the technical problems and yada yada, but also because the margins on physical goods are really, really low. And even contract manufacturing places are operating at 2 to 3% profit margin. This is a really risky business to get into because you're fighting over the crumbs already. And I think it's something that we should think about as we encourage people to do hardware. And a lot of people's antidote to that is, well, it's not just about the hardware, it's about the software. It's about the data collection. It's about the way that you improve the person's life. But we all know that those services will be replicated too, just as hardware will be commoditized, services will be commoditized too, the data, the, um, the software layer that you put on your light or or thermostat or whatever can also be replicated. So I think what we need to do is look even further beyond. Like, it's not about the hardware, it's not about the software that makes it sticky, but it's actually about improving the experience for the customer in a way that gets back to the way that things used to be made. And so, as hardware companies, we have to compete with, with the, the very large companies that could just take our business out overnight. I'm very aware of all of those large companies that could just demolish other machine company, kind of on a whim. Uh, and the way that I think companies like us remain competitive is we have to beat them at their own game. First of all, we have to deliver something at the same price, but we have to be faster. We have to offer more levels of customization to these physical goods. And we also have to infuse story into what we do. And I think of story, some people could call it brand or whatever, but this has infinite value. And it's even deeper than design, like something can feel wonderful when you put it on, but when you know who made it for you, it feels personal, and that is so much more valuable that, you know, it's, it's actually a thing that could cause you to buy one thing over another. And we're kind of to that point, like it's really hard to discern one product over another when the only thing you can compare to, compare on is price. So I put this image up there because this is the experience I want when I'm purchasing clothes. I want to have a tailor, but it's not cost effective for me to have a tailor. So instead I go to the store and I buy pants that are just an average and I always hate them. Nobody likes the pants that they get because it's not pants for you. And what I'm wondering is like, why are we in this situation? We have tools, we have know-how, we could have distributed manufacturing centers where custom clothes could be made, but why aren't we? And I'm just kind of opening, opening this up to, for us to think about because, you know, why does the Gap sh spend millions of dollars sending racks of clothes to all of these stores and distribution centers? And why is fashion not a continuous process? And it's because there's these design cycles and there's seasons because they invest and they create averages and they ship them out. But I feel like a better experience for me would be if I went to the store, I got my body scanned, and instead of racks of clothes, they just shipped batches of new files and bolts of fabric, and the people in the stores could make the clothes for me. So there's, this is kind of like a really weird vision, like what if all of the things that we bought, we literally went to and they were manufactured while we were waiting. Um, the reason why this doesn't happen, I think there's two reasons actually. Um, one is 
that you have people in these stores who are folding clothes. And it's a big leap to, to imagine those people also fabricating the clothes with machines that are easy to use. And that's the big barrier, is the machines are too difficult, they're too inexpensive, it costs too much to train people to use them, and that's a real problem. And the other one is, we just haven't forced this to happen yet. We haven't demanded it, and we haven't decided as a group of people that this is an important thing to do. But I think it's really important. And I like to imagine this, this world where um, the average person knows how to do the basics. They know how to design digitally. They know how to run a manufacturing tool. And it's just part of their lives. And the, the great thing is, is that we're already kind of close to that. Um, and I want to show one example, which is kind of what happens when you just start putting the tools out there. Like, yes, it'll take us a long time to, to raise the level of technical competence of everyone. Um, but when you do, amazing things happen. This is an example. Uh, so this person, it's, it's the perfect example in my mind of what happens when you give people access and they really understand a problem. So the person who built this contraption is in that tent. So they are hiding from the cold. They're, very, they're just like having the time of their lives and sort of chuckling at the fact that they built this thing which makes their life so much better. It's a wearable device. But the outside part of the wearable device is this ice fishing rod. So this thing is 3D printed, it has a sensor on the end of it. Whenever this person gets a bite, it sends a signal to the inside of the tent. This is a wearable device that this person is wearing on their body. It vibrates. He gets up, he goes outside, and he's like, oh, either this is a fish I want, Yahtzee, I can put more bait out on there, or it's a fish I don't want, and I can let it go quickly and help the fish survive more often. And to me, this is a person who loves to fish loves doing CAD, like design, knows electronics, has access to a milling machine, has access to a 3D printer, and really cares about wildlife ecology. And there's no barriers between this person and the thing that they wanted to build. And to me, this is really compelling. But it also is a signal to the type of world that I think we want to build which is one where there are people who look really different and they come from all walks of life, but they all have the ability to solve these problems and all of their opinions are valued. So it's not just about engineers being really great at solving problems, it's about having people who have technical empathy. They understand how their products are going to fit into the world. And this is what we need to be competitive. We have to be better than the people who are just competing on price. And we have to be better than the people who are just competing on software features. It has to be even a step above. We have to understand our customers even better and give them the tools that are gonna make their lives richer. And this is the only way I think that, that these hardware companies that we're trying to inspire uh, survive. Um, because the problems of the future are really multi-dimensional. If you think about healthcare, for example, that's a data problem, a dignity problem, a software problem, a hardware problem. These are really intense. And I think that we need to do more to encourage young people and actually just put tools in the hands of children. And so the good news is, is that the tools are already out there. The software is already out there. The little machines are already out there. And all we have to do is start giving sharp tools to kids so that they can build real things that are real materials. And uh, I'm, I'm very excited, actually, for the world where all of us have this level of knowledge and command over these dis different disciplines, and we can actually solve problems uh, in ways that improve our lives. So, if, oh, and if you want to hear more about the nitty gritty of how our business uses data and local manufacturing to produce a high precision manufacturing tool, you can come to my talk at 4.30 tomorrow. I will tell you all of the details about how to get it done. So, thanks a lot.